6th of October, 2021. Uh, we're going to run for about 30 to 40 minutes and hopefully uh, you'll get a ton of value out of today's session. So before we get into it, as always, I want to ask you a question before you pepper us with questions. I want to know what's more important. Is it information or knowledge? So those of you that are new for, here for the first time, just have a think about it, information or knowledge. What do you think is more important? What do you think is going to win the day? All right, I'm not going to dwell on that too long. The answer is knowledge. So those of you that think, oh, that doesn't matter if you got it wrong, there's no such thing as a wrong answer. Well, in this case, there is definitely a wrong answer. Now, why do I say that? Well, information is organized data about something. And there is a ton of information out there. In this day and age, we are what we call the information age. There is so much information out there. But what there isn't is knowledge because knowledge is an understanding either through experience or an education. So, you know, it's not information in itself. It's the ability to turn that information into knowledge, uh, not only on a macro, uh, you know, high level sense, but personally for you and your circumstances. And that is what's key. And that's why I say that is what's going to win the day. Um, so really, really important concept. And that's what today is all about. Uh, it's about hopefully breaking down all that information that's out there and turning it into knowledge for you so that you, hopefully after today, will understand the framework as to how to break it down. We would have done it for you, worked with you, um, answering all of your questions, and hopefully given you a new way to look at, at that information and to progress forward and hopefully be able to take action when you see that come through. So, you know, Warren Buffett here, he says it really, really simply in nine words. Risk comes from not knowing what you're doing. So it's not about having that information. It's about being able to turn that information into knowledge. And if you don't, well, then you don't know what's happening. And that's where the risk comes into it. So really, really important thing. Now, that's great. But how does that apply? And how does that apply to you as a potential homeowner? Well, um, I wasn't always a homeowner. You know, just like you on the line today, uh, I've been in share houses. I've rented for years and years and years. You know, I've lived from pay to pay. I understand what it's like getting, you know, a week out before payday, having three or four dollars thinking, you know, how many loaves of bread can I buy? How am I going to get by? Not even being able to think about the possibility of ever saving additional money for a deposit, getting that first home. And when you do have that first home, saving more, paying that loan down and potentially moving into becoming a property investor. It's tough. I've been there, I understand it. Today, very, very different story. I now own 11 investment properties, um, my own home, and I've owned countless homes over the last couple of decades. So, you know, I've understood the, the challenges, I know where it goes. So what do I bring to the table is not only that experience, but also for those of you that don't know, um, I am by trade an accountant. Um, so I do understand the concept of numbers. Those of you that love to analyze everything to death, I know the trap you can fall in with overanalyzing, but I also understand what's important to get in behind not only the emotional idea of buying a home and having a place to live and a place of your own, but also understanding the nuts and bolts as to how it might best work and why what you think on the face is not always the best um, option for you and how it goes. So you know, that's very much what I bring to the table. And I hope um, after the next 30 minutes, you're going to have a ton of value delivered to you. So how are we going to do it? Um, really, really simple. I'm going to break down today's session into two parts. The first one is going to be the information part. I'm going to tell you what are some of our highlights that we've seen happening around the countryside um, over the last seven days and the auction results. Um, and then we're going to move to the second session. So that first session will go for about five to 10 minutes. Then we're going to go into the knowledge section where we're going to take all of your questions live um, and try and answer them and break all of that information down into knowledge um, so that you can leave here today with a clear understanding of what it should mean for you personally um, and it's how you can move forward. And that will go for about 20, 25 minutes, depending on how many questions we've got. Um, and then I'll close up with, uh, you know, it doesn't matter where you are on that ladder in terms of whether you're just renting, you're looking to buy your first home, or you're thinking about becoming a property investor, or you might even be a seasoned property investor. Um, I'll tell you the next logical step that I see for you to be able to move forward in that journey, wherever you are. Um, so do stick around because I guarantee you, um, you know, if you get value out of the session today, you'll want to know as to how you can keep delivering that value, keep moving forward, and hopefully shortcut as to where you are in terms of achieving your goals. So 
Um, let's jump into section one. This will be quick and fast, so focus, take it in, start dropping all your questions in the Q&A, so when we get to that section, you'll be top of the list. So what do we see happening around the countryside? Um, CoreLogic, obviously, start of the month. We love this. We get all the stats. Um, so they put out the house price stats. Um, you'd be surprised. It was the fastest growing um, period that we've had since 1989. Now, for a lot of you on the line today, you probably weren't even born then. Um, I think everyone uh, on the panel today, uh, except for Greg, maybe, was born in 1989. Greg was probably in his second or third rock band by then. Um, so there, but, you know, the rest of us are alive. We understand what it is. But that was more than 30 years ago. So really, really great conditions, particularly in light of the lockdowns here in Melbourne, um, which have been a total disaster for, um, you know, actually having housing sales come through. So great to still see that uh, we saw such a strong result. A um, lot of chat about uh, crackdown on home loans, new policies coming in. I know a lot of you are going to have a ton of questions about that. Everything that we know to date, we're going to break down and, and explain to you what, how it may impact you and what you can do to prepare yourself for the future. Um, tenants, those of you that are investors, uh, they're perhaps one of your best assets, but often forgotten about. So we're going to talk through that. Um, of course, coming off that great strong month in the last 12 months, uh, we've seen one of the highest levels of profit-making sales. Uh, this is nationally. Obviously, uh, you know, there's, there's the sort of regional mining town areas that tend to bring these stats down. But nationally, we saw nine out of 10 people making a profit on those sales. We're going to break down the stats on that and how they did it, where the wins and losses came from. Um, and then spring market. So as I said, with all these changes coming through um, and where we are, we're now almost halfway through uh, spring. Daylight savings has come where it's here. So how can you best set yourself up to make sure you capitalize on it? whether you're buying, selling, or just being a spectator. All right, so moving forward, what do we see in the auction results? Well, it was a stellar weekend. Obviously, Melbourne was back with a bang. We saw 84% national figure. Why? It was the Melbourne story. We're at 87%, which is a phenomenal result. Those of you who remember that over the last six, eight weeks, we were seeing results in the 50s because our Premier had us banned, locked out, not allowed to leave our homes, not allowed to go inspect. So everyone was pulling their auctions. They're finally starting to come back in. And as I said to you, you guys are going to start seeing these numbers of auctions. So you can see over in this graph here, um, almost half, so 800 of the 1,900 odd auctions last weekend all happened in Melbourne. Um, and that number is only going to get bigger. I expect to see probably, maybe not this weekend, but in the next few weekends and going right through to uh, just before Christmas, I expect to see multiple Super Saturdays happening here in Melbourne as we catch up to the rest of uh, the country that's been going. So um, it's a new format from CoreLogic that they've done rather than the table. Um, if you like it, drop some comments in, uh, in the chat or wherever you are. Uh, me personally, uh, as I said at the start, I prefer a simple table or seeing it, but graphically here, you can see where everything was tracking. The reason why you may often hear is say, you know, who cares about Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, Tasmania, Canberra? Um, as far as auction markets go, you can see they don't really add a lot in terms of the number of transactions. That's why it's very much the Sydney and Melbourne story in terms of the size of the markets. Um, now, how do those statistics work? Well, you can see here, first of all, they look at it and why they often say preliminary um, auction results is because these are the numbers. So Melbourne, for example, they've got 679 of those 800 auctions. They've already got the results. Of those, you can see the 87%, so just under 600, uh, sold and a mere 88 didn't actually get a result. So that's why you see that 87% uh, percent figure coming through. So really, really good result. Again, as you can see, it's all a story about Sydney and Melbourne. Um, and as we always say, they are the biggest housing markets. They make up in their own, right? Each of them individually, more than, uh, than the rest of the countryside put together, which is why we always like to focus on those two key markets. Um, those of you that are long-time listeners will know I typically transition now over to a forward-looking uh, statistic that we get from realestate.com. Um, I'm not sure what's happened. Uh, realestate.com seem to have not published those this week. Um, I've reached out to them. I don't know whether they've decided to stop publishing it. Uh, maybe the person that does it's got corona, has been in uh, isolation, or they're just tired and didn't get a chance to do it. I don't know. So hopefully they will be back next week or, or sometime later. Uh, but for now, um, I can't tell you uh, exactly where those are tracking, other than, as you could expect, with these results we've seen in the auction um, and those kind of numbers, expect that the buyer demand is, uh, 
is obviously peaking as we've been seeing over these last couple of weeks um, as transactions and the markets start to open up again. So um, that's it. It's even shorter and sharper than ever. Those of you that are sick of hearing my voice going on and on will be happy. Those of you that are first time listeners might be wanting more. That's the information section done. Um, think about it, start getting your questions in the Q&A um, and we're gonna jump into that in about 30 seconds. Before I do, um, myself, uh, my name is James Maitland. For those of you that, uh, that don't know or didn't catch it at the start, um, I'm the general manager here at Salvo. I'm Salvo, we do a ton of different things, uh, but ultimately all of our different businesses are all about helping you create a home. So whether you're looking to rent your home for the first time, you may be a seasoned investor, a first home buyer, or looking to upgrade. It doesn't matter where you are on that ladder. We can help you. Uh, we've got a ton of businesses with under that umbrella that are all about helping you create a home. Um, I've been doing this for more than 20 years, um, and I've helped create more than 11,500 homes for people like you on the phone. Um, joined on the panel today, answering all of your questions, Greg Arbeck, the youngest uh, team member we've got, Jack Gian, and Lucas Karras. So these guys are going to be answering all of your questions. I will be hosting it and trying to get through and putting to the guys all of your questions. If I don't get to all of them, I do apologize. We will try to reach out to you um, at the end of today's session um, and answer that. Otherwise, of course, feel free to join us again next week. We're here every single Wednesday, as always. Um, how do you do it? If you're not sure, there's two simple ways. You can either jump in the Q&A as everyone prefers to do. If you're feeling brave, we haven't had anyone for a long, long time feeling brave raise your hand, we'll unmute you, um, put your camera on and you can jump up like you were at a real live event um, and ask your question off the panel. So feel free to do that if you prefer. Otherwise, stick to the tried and tested method of putting in the Q&A. All right, let's get stuck into it. As I said, we will run for probably 20 odd minutes, 25 minutes now. So it's going to be hard. It's going to be fast. Take notes, turn your phone upside down, put it on silent and focus now because this is where we're going to deliver the value. Remember what I said, We've talked about the information, but you need to turn that into knowledge. So ask us the questions, let, you, let us help you guide you through and create that knowledge um, and or just listen to the framework we're using to break it down so that you can go out there and do that yourself. So um, first question, of course, everyone wants to know, uh, Lucas, house prices, 1989, what a great year. It was probably, um, I don't know, the year that the boy bands weren't known as boy bands, but uh, were high on there. What was it? New Kids on the Block, I think, might have been around at that time. Um, tell us, what did we see? What are the stats showing us? Um, you know, what have, we, uh, what have we seen over this month? Um, and I guess the, the year to date and, and the last 12 months. Yes, uh, James. Look, uh, September, the home uh, value rose another 1.5%, bringing their housing values 17.6% higher than the first nine months of the year and 20.3% higher over the past 12 months. So how does that compare to all those doomsdayers this time last year? Prices are going to drop by 50%, 30%, whatever it is. That's pretty much a slap in the face. You know, 20% we've seen in the last 12 months. I mean, what a turnaround. Yeah, and look, that is the fastest rate uh, since year end in June 1989. And, and what um, about our hometown? Because I know everyone has been laying it on Melbourne a little bit. We've got world records for everything. Um, you know, the longest time in lockdown, the highest number of cases in the country. Um, you know, when New South Wales was getting more airtime, we had an earthquake a few weeks ago. We've got all these records for perhaps not such good things. Um, how did Melbourne track in terms of that? You know, a lot of people will be saying, oh, yeah, but Melbourne was terrible. Can you break down their stats for the last 12 months? Sure. Look, um, first of all, for the month, uh, Melbourne was 0.8% up. For the quarter, and that, we were locked down point, for that entire month and we still managed to exactly. get almost a 1% up. Exactly. For the quarter, 3.3% up. Um, for the annual, for the year, 15% up. And total return, 17.9%. So any of those people that are worried about Melbourne, I think it's still done fantastically through this period. But I think, Lucas, it would be fair to say... Um, you know, a lot of talk about the trend moving forward over the next 12 months and into 2022 that it's still going to be going up, but at a much slower pace. You know, what are you thinking for Melbourne? I know we always talk about it being sort of behind, um, you know, because of all these lockdowns and so forth. Are you expecting Melbourne to sort of surge ahead and perhaps be the, the best performer over the next 12 months or is it going to continue to underperform? 
Look, the expectations are that Melbourne will be the um, the leader because we were we fell behind through to all the lockdowns, and and we see straight away even in a week after we reopened, you can see with the auction results, all those people that were on hold are now rushing out the door running to to get into the property market. Of, of course, things nationally will slow down a little bit only because with the housing pricing increasing more than their uh, incomes, faster rate than their incomes are. So of course, that's going to be a little bit harder for people to enter the market and that slows it down a little bit. But there's no indication that things are going to slow down at all. Okay. Um, And so who's actually buying at the moment? Like what's the composition that we're seeing out there with these results? You know, is it investors, first home buyers? Who's... Who's making up? Who's the one driving over the last, you know, all this year, all these sales? Look, we have seen the owner occupiers and the first home buyers uh, decrease in July. However, we saw the investors increase. And and quite importantly, more specifically, James, the first home buyers that are buying for investment, they're the ones that are coming strongly into the market. They're doing what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, which is rent fest. So they second, just... You lost me there. First home buyers are investors. Just sorry, just exactly. break, break that down for everyone. Well, okay, okay. The first home buyers that are trying to get the food in the door, that are trying to buy their dream home, and obviously they, they find it a little bit hard. So they're becoming what we said rent investors, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago. So which is rent in the place you want to live and buy in the area that you can afford so that you get your foot in the door. So that is what we actually seen happen quite strongly uh, now from first home buyers. All right. Well, that's, um, that's a big thing. You know, it uh, perhaps isn't what you would normally expect to hear first home buyers becoming investors before they actually get their first home they're going to live in. Um, but, you know, that's very much what we always talk about, you know, I think every week we always talk about some things where you've got to look to compromise on certain aspects. So as Lucas said, don't necessarily compromise on a key location, but perhaps it's not the location that you want to live, but it's somewhere that is a fantastic location and you can afford. Um, And of course, who do they call if they want to uh, find out the great location and buy? Uh, Lucas. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. I can see Um, Greg's face already, um, head in his hands, getting upset with that. I do want to mention a few more uh, statistics, though, James, if you allow me. All right, hit it. Uh, Now, first of all, it's very important because a lot of people uh, say, no, but apartments, this is not the case. For all those people, I just want to well let them know that in September quarter, apartment prices rose more than house prices. So for all those people out there that have no faith in apartment living, well, the stats are showing us something completely different. And that's what now, we expect, isn't it, Lucas? Because typically we always say there's about a six, six to nine month lag. You know, houses go up first, they hit that ceiling and then apartments start to catch up again, isn't it? So that's, that's what we all knew was going to happen. But I guess for some people out there that were like, yeah, 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 we're now actually getting vindicated because you're seeing that trend start to, to occur. That's right, that's right. And look, uh, i just talk a little bit about the amount of listings and everything we have available currently. So the listings remain extremely low. Uh, So we're actually minus 28.1% for the number of listings that we have now when we're looking at a five-year average. And the number of homes that are selling is 25% higher than the five-year average. And are whooping 41.9% higher than year on year. So we can see the difference between lockdown and partly freedom. (laughs) <laughs> um, all right, I've got to stop you there because I've seen quite a few questions. Um, Brian's just put it in again. Uh, Linda's put one in. Um, who else there? I think it was Charles, Don. Um, everyone's asking about, uh, you know, I think there was some chat even today about it, but definitely over the last week or so, we've been talking about the regulators, uh, people talking about housing bubbles. Uh, there's parliamentary inquiries going to everything. Um, and home loans, you know, we know that that's typically in order for the vast majority, if not almost everyone to buy a home needs to get a home loan. Um, And there's a lot of talk about cracking down on those policies and so forth. Um, Can someone break it down for everyone here? You know, why are the government, the regulators, the commentators, everyone wanting to to potentially put in place some kind of changes? Like, why is it? 
Yes, James. The reason has been very simple because they are saying that more than 20% is uh, home buyers borrowing more than six times of the income. So there is the highest uh, percentage we ever, never have, even uh, back to 2014 and 2017, which was the last time the regulator APIA set up the, the tough uh, lending rules. It's not okay. even this higher. Because I think also, I, I think it might've been Lucas was chatting us through last week you know, with the median house price and what kind of income you needed and so forth. So, you know, being more than six times, let's say you're on a, an income of 100,000, then six times would be a, a loan of 600,000 or more, which isn't too crazy when you think about median house prices are over a million dollars in in the two main uh, main suburbs of, uh, of Sydney and Melbourne. So perhaps you can break it down a bit more for the guys, Jack. You know, what, if that's the why, um, you know, what are the regulators thinking about? You know, what can you tell our listeners perhaps might happen, what these policies are and, um, you know, sort of how they might affect them? Yes, James, because this time, and we have a completely different situation with last time back to 2014 and 2017, but that time I think is more investment loan and interest only loan on the market. But now we're seeing the most the majority of the application is from the uh, first home buyer and owner occupier. So there could be the new lending restriction is being different with last time. The possible things, I think maybe the three. So the first thing is that it could be involved the putting a limited on how much money people could borrow. For example, they will say the money you can borrow are limited up to six times of your income, no more. Or maybe it puts some limit on the proportion of your lending amount. Or it could be introduced a lower LVR ratio for your home application. So which means for the first home buyer or the owner occupier, you might need a bigger deposit if those coming out. Another option is could be for the lender, it will be introduced the higher the interest rate buffer, which is used to assess the people's ability to repay the, the loan. I think this morning the APRA has already announced, which is came out since the bank have to modeling how borrow how borrower can could cope up with 3% interest rate rose from the 2.5%. So, you know, I think that debt to income ratio is a, an interesting one because, you know, we haven't seen that before in Australia, but just I've done the quick maths while you're talking, Jack, you know, if we're talking about a million dollar loan, which, you know, back in 1989, when Greg was just a young man, would have sounded like a huge and impossible loan to ever have, but this day and age, a million dollars is not that big a loan. You know, using that maximum six times ratio, you need to be earning about one hundred and sixty-six thousand dollars as a bare minimum. So, you know, if you've got to be well within that, it might be one hundred and seventy, one hundred and eighty, which is a pretty big salary this day and age. Um, I know for you guys on the panel, that's uh, that's chicken feed with the amount of uh, business you guys write. But for the for the average person out there, that's a big, big salary. Um, and you know, for a loan that potentially is just what they need to get an average house. So. Um, I think that's really going to be interesting how that plays out um, and how that might factor into the market. So I want to go one step further. And Jack, I don't know if you've got the answers, maybe someone else, if, if you don't, can jump in. But if we then take that's potentially what's going to happen, if everyone on the line today, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, the rest of this year, obviously we mentioned before, we're almost halfway through spring, uh, which is typically the biggest selling season. Melbourne's opened up allowing private inspections again. And hopefully by next month, we'll actually, the lockdown would have ended and, and, and more of these restrictions will ease. What does that actually mean if, you know, this selling season's in full swing? You know, from a, anyone who's on the line as a buyer and perhaps also as a seller, what should they be doing to protect themselves or position themselves to, to make sure that these potential changes, if they do come through, don't affect them or that they can capitalise on them in the best way possible? Yes, James, as you said, and uh, if, if for the first home buyer and uh, the, the owner occupy, if they buy in the first home, they just want to get into market. If those rules is being introduced for them, 
it sounds like like the big impact because you either need a big deposit and or you need have like higher income, which is for them, for the young couple, which it sounds like very hard. So then that's why they some people they will predict if those being introduced, the house price is going to be slowing down in next year, probably by 65 percent. We were saying this year, the last 12 months, the housing price increased 20 percent, which is, you know, it's amazing. So if that's is being the true, like if they slowing down by 65 percent next year, we we're still seeing the 7 percent increase on the housing price. And Which then is still we're talking- pretty, pretty good. I reckon we'd be wrapped with 7% uh, <laughs> in ordinary time. We've got a little bit greedy now getting 20%. Yeah. So that's why I think maybe some buyer were thinking, okay, because so probably the price will slow down. Let's, you know, wait. And, uh, but that's not the, the idea because if those being introduced for the host first home buyer or the, you know, they, they means they need the bigger deposit or the very hard, even harder to get in a loan. So that's why we're saying this spring selling season, which is just a start last week, normally the Melbourne, you know, in the next year, uh, last year and this year, we a little bit delayed for the starting of the, the spring selling season. And we're seeing the, still the lot, lot, lot more demand from the buyers or the people, they're ready to buy, they already to put it in, in loan application just before the due dates if those be introduced. Um, so for example, this weekend we were saying the national auction are up by the more than 20%. And especially in Melbourne, like we're talking about in the very beginning, James, the, the Melbourne is more than double the, 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 the auction. Is coming up since we are uh, we are allowed to do the inspection. The the restriction has been eased, and also for the sellers, and it's also to push them to maybe go ahead if they thinking of selling the property, and that's why we're seeing the lot more the property coming onto the market for sale um, from the uh, the. The statics showing from by the Rewhite, which is the biggest uh, agency across the country, the number of the sellers has signed up with the agent ready for sale nationally during the last months. It increased by 13%, which means a lot more people are ready to sell because, you know, potentially those coming restriction and also the upcoming is already the, the start of the spring selling season. Okay, good. So a um, ton of information Jack shared there for you, but for those of you that perhaps weren't listening tightly, let me give you a quick summary because I think it's really, really important concept we talked about there. So first of all, we're faced with potentially some regulatory changes that may or may not affect you, may or may not affect your potential buyers or you being able to buy a house. But even if they do, uh, we're still expecting to see 7% growth next year. So don't think that prices are going to go down and wait because as Jack said, you might be able to borrow more today that you can't tomorrow, which doesn't mean that those prices are going to drop because they're still going to keep going up. You're just going to be limited as to what you can afford to now buy and borrow if you can't borrow more from mum and dad to, to help you get through, which means you're going to have more people competing, which means the prices are likely to go up even more than if you just buy now. So really, really important concept. The other thing to remember and why prices don't just go down is that prices go up really quickly and easily because buyers are happy to say, right, I want that home and I'll pay that price and sellers are happy to make a profit. Really, really simple. But I tell you what, if you've ever sold a property, the last thing you ever want to do is get less than the price you've got in your mind, right? Now, of course, people have silly prices and they've got to come down. But typically people, unless they're desperate, will say, that's my price and I'll hold for that price. So that's why we don't see prices quickly drop down. And typically they just keep going because people have persistence. And as we know, persistence beats resistance. So, you know, just remember what Jack said. Don't expect prices to drop. They're still going to go up. Um, but potentially, if you're one of those people that are looking to borrow more than six times your income, now might be the time to jump on it before any of these changes come in. Um, and likewise, when you're looking to sell, just keep that in mind where your price sits and where it is in terms of the market that you've got. Those of you with really low priced homes might be able to capitalize on those changes because you've got more people focused on that's all they can afford. Those of you with slightly higher priced homes 
uh, may be able to get more people competing for it now. So really just think about it. As I said, take that information, break down that knowledge, understand it and apply it to your own circumstances. All right, now it's three o'clock, but I still got a, quite a few questions I've seen coming through. So I'm gonna try and go through this quickly. Um, just, I mentioned at the top of, uh, of this uh, session about nine out of 10 people making profit um, at the moment. So that's 90%, you know, how does that track? Um, when did we last see these kind of results? Um, and perhaps, you know, how are they being transacted? Is it, is it through, um, you know, people holding on forever or what's the average sort of hold period that we've seen people um, have those properties that have made these kind of profits? Uh, yes, James, uh, that is correct. Nine out of 10 sellers or more, more than nine out of 10 sellers uh, sold at a profit during the June quarter, which is the highest uh, proportion since 2011. Uh, so for an average home that was held for 8.8 .8 years, they made an average profit of $265,000. Okay, so eight years, that's typically, we always say you got to hold for the long term perhaps a little bit shorter than we might ordinarily say. And I guess, you know, that might be because we definitely know the last 12 months has been a fantastic period and, and people have been perhaps upgrading quicker than they might've thought they could afford to as they got a stellar price for the house. But, you know, just remember eight years and we're seeing 90% of people make a profit. You know, that's really, really key. And I'm sure that within those stats, Lucas, I'm guessing there's some people that held for a really short period and made a ton of profit as well, capitalizing in, you know, buying perhaps 18 months ago when everyone thought the world was going to end and reselling now, which is great. That does happen, but that's not a strategy. So it's probably that if, you know, if you took them out, it's probably more like a 10, 11, 12 year hold, which is what's really, really important. We always say you've got to be prepared to hold for the long term uh, to make sure you get through those cycles and really capitalize on that value. Um, okay. One of the most important things, if you are ever a property investor, is your tenant. But for most of you, you will spend weeks, months, for some of you even years, researching the location, the demographics, um, the type of property you should buy, going to open homes, going to auctions, all about getting that right property in the right location, which don't get me wrong, that is really, really important as it comes to the buying phase, you know, finding that right property. But when it does become your home and it does become your investment property, you move from that finding phase to what we call the managing phase. And when you're managing there, there is a ton of important things you've got to do, but it all revolves around the tenant. And I think it's probably one of the forgotten arts. So, you know, that is important. Um, and, you know, why, Greg, is it that, you know, people forget about the tenant um, and why is it so important? And perhaps you can maybe give everyone on the line a few quick tips as to how they can make sure they focus on that tenant. So when they have found the right property, it turns out to be a fantastic property because they manage it appropriately and make sure that income keeps coming through. As you say, James, all these other elements are so important. But once you have a good tenant or you want to attract a good tenant, the key thing is to keep that tenant. So that is where what they're now talking about, the human touch. The old days where you had the vicious landlord who didn't give a damn about his tenant is gone. You've got to, you've got to be looking at this as you providing a service almost, that you, you're providing a service for rent. So it's, it's a very different mindset in terms of managing it, whether it's yourself or with an agent, you need to consider those, those sort of issues. Key things about that is maintenance. Every, every time something goes wrong, the old landlord would throw his hands up and doesn't want to spend a cent because I come from a time, as you know, I'm the old guy, where we brought up we could do anything. We were taught to do things. Something broke, you fix it. Something, mm. you fix it. You'd but, sort of go down the road and look for the, um, the council pickup, wouldn't you, and find a dishwasher on there and just bring it home and stick it in bring yourself. It home, fix it up. That's gone. Current tenants or younger people don't know that. They've got no idea. They're, they've, it's a different, a different generation. They expect it's like our younger to... kids, Greg. All they know is an iPad, isn't it? That's they it. wouldn't have and the they... first clue as to how to fix an un they've got No a idea. So they're expecting and they need it. If they're a good tenant, which is what you, you're trying to attract, look after them. If there's an issue, make sure it's attended to quickly. Start understanding who your tenant is. Understand why they're in your area. Um, if if they need be be, be flexible. So important that you, in the current way, in the current market, things like that, 
is that you look after your tenant. Make sure you keep them. Be flexible. Think of it as you as doing a service. And very critically, if you decide to use an agent, make sure that agent is not belligerent <laughs> and is actually <laughs> going to carry through on that sort of thing to make, you know, do your research, make sure you're using the right agency that will carry that through to ensure you keep your tenants in the long term, look after them. Right, sound advice. And I can tell you from a, an agent perspective, you know, we're now, um, you know, part of, I think, almost 4,000 properties we manage on behalf of, um, of people just like you on the call today. So we've got a huge, huge rent roll. And let me tell you, one of the, the key things that we drive through that business is that we have two customers, right? Most property management businesses will think they have one customer, which is the owner or the landlord, however you want to term it, and that is it. I instill in everyone and it's very much part of how we work is we have two customers, the landlord and the tenant. Mm -hmm. And very much everyone that works in this organization is very much got that drilled into them. And they're always thinking that, you know, part of, you know, their job is 50% managing one customer, the owner and the landlord. And the other one is our other key customer being the tenant, because you need both of them to make a good marriage, to make a good investment property. And really that's the difference between having an okay property and an amazing property because the rental income is what keeps you going through that whole period. You know, Lucas talked about it just before. The average whole period is eight years. I said to you, it's probably got to be more like 11, 12, 13 years. So you want to get the most rental income you can possibly get so you get the best return during that whole period. And then you get the cream on top with that capital gain. So really, really important concept. Um, and I think, you know, as I said to you before, you know, we have a sort of a, a three-part um, you know, triangle framework we talk about where you've got to find the right property, you've got to finance it appropriately, and the key thing, you've got to manage it well. So, you know, it is important to do all those things that we said at the start to find the right property. But once you've found it, you've got to focus on that managed section and make sure that you're managing it appropriately um, to keep that becoming a great property that you spent all that time and energy and spent so much money buying, you want to realise it um, and have it be as good as it possibly can be. All right, look, um, I know there's a few more questions. We're about, what am I seeing on my clock here? 308. So uh, let's just wrap it up there. As I said before, um, if there's any more questions we haven't got to, uh, we will go through the transcript and the Q&A after this um, and reach out to you guys and hopefully answer them for you direct via email um, or feel free to, um, to give us a call um, or reply to any of our emails. However it is you best like to communicate and we'll try and help you there. Otherwise, do join us again next week and we will, um, we will try to get to those questions. So um, as I said, today, I hope you said, wow, that was great. I learned something new. I understand the framework. Whatever it is, hopefully you got something out of today. And if you did, well, don't be like what you would normally do and what I can guarantee you now that probably 90% of you are going to do. And what's that? You're going to do nothing, okay? You're going to say that was good, but you know what? Uh, what is it? School's about to finish. I've got to take the kids to the park. I want to go have a run, whatever it is. And you're not going to do anything about this. You're going to forget about it and you're going to get back into the normal um, role of life. And for a lot of you, that's fine. But what I just want to say is if you don't make a change, don't expect to get a different result. So if you are trying to buy that first home, you are trying to get a better investment property, whatever it is that you're trying to do and you haven't been able to achieve it, well, then Think about this. You've got to make a change to be able to get a different result. You know, we, we all know the saying that doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. You know, I'm not saying that you're insane, but don't expect to get a different result if you don't make a change. So what I hope you guys do as a bare minimum is take on board the framework we've talked about. Think about this concept of turning that information into knowledge. Think about what can you do to fast forward? What changes can you make? and take that framework, everything we've discussed today, and go out there and apply it and do it yourself. And I guarantee you, if you make some of those changes, you understand the framework that we've talked about, you will see the results come in. But what I really, really want all of you to do, or as many of you as possible, is take that shortcut. You know, we're all looking for that, for that next quick fix. This isn't going to make you get rich quick, but join us, let us help you. You know, I said at the start of today's session, that we have a ton of different businesses. There's a lot of different things we do. And I guarantee you that we will be able to help you on that journey to creating a home. It doesn't matter where you are. You know, as I said, it doesn't matter if you're looking to just rent a property, you're looking to become a first-time investor, 
right up to being a seasoned investor or a first home buyer, wherever you are on that journey, I guarantee you we can help you um, short track, get there faster or achieve that goal quicker and better than you can on your own. So, you know, who's this for? Well, if you're still listening, you're still focused, then it's probably for you. Um, but we're not going to be a good fit for everyone. You know, that ultimately that, uh, you know, not all of you are going to fit in with what we want to do. So what kind of characteristics you got to do? You've got to be prepared to do the work, roll up your sleeves, um, get involved and make those changes. You know, you've got to understand this concept of actionable knowledge, as I said, turning that information into knowledge and not letting any negativity that might be out there bring you down and get you stuck. You know, you've got to be able to see through that and see for the long term, as Lucas talked about those whole periods. And ultimately, you've got to be able to take that action, do those next steps. So, you know, what we're going to show you is a framework. You know, you can either let us do a lot of the work for you or very little of the work. You know, it can be, we can be as involved or as un uninvolved as you like. We very much just want to help you down that path, give you the framework, show you the way to go. Um, and then it's up to you as to how you get there. But ultimately, you've got to be prepared to take that action. Otherwise, you're just going to be ending up back in that other category of path A where you're going to do nothing and you're not going to get the results. So how do we do this? Well, I know a lot of you be saying, yeah, 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 but I don't have time for this. We're in lockdown. I don't want to be sold anything. Well, I understand that. So I've thought long and hard. And I believe the best way that I can guarantee to give you value, just like we did today, for the smallest possible commitment from you is to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with you um, obviously, it'll be virtual at the moment. You know, I think if you are based in Melbourne, we might be able to do a face-to-face, -face, but ideally we can do it over the phone. We can do it on WhatsApp. We can do it on Zoom. We can do it on FaceTime, however you want. And I'm talking about 15 to 20 minutes of your time. So it is the smallest possible commitment I'm asking from you, but I still guarantee you we can get you a result and you can actually see value out of this. So you know, what do we do? Um, really, really simple. We just have a quick chat. Um, get an understanding where you are on that ladder. You know, are you just looking to rent your first home? Are you a seasoned investor or somewhere in between that rungs so that we can suggest the appropriate ways and the appropriate parts of our business that might be able to assist you to get further down that track. Also understand your goals and really just give you a bit of a framework. So when you leave that, whether you decide to, to reach out to us again and move forward with any of that, Hopefully, we've still given you value that you can go out and you can do it yourself. Because as I said, we'd love to help you, but ultimately, we want to see you achieve your goals. So if that means we can um, transfer some of that value and you can go out there and do it yourself, then great. Um, but I do say that for most people, if you want to get there faster, do what the rich do and work with the professionals, work with people like ourselves that can help you get there faster. So if that sounds like you, um, how do you do it? Really, really simple. Three ways. Um, jump into the chat if you're on Zoom and there's a link there. Uh, have a look at your web browser when you're redirected into this Zoom webinar. That should have the booking page. Lastly, if you're not sure um, or you want to wait and just check your diaries or check with your partner, I will send you a follow-up email after the end of today's session with that link that you can book those um, at any time. Just remember, they do book out fast. I have dedicated in everyone's diaries just for these, uh, but they do tend to book out really, really fast. So jump in and get your preferred time so that you don't miss out and you can move forward um, in today's market. So as I said, I guarantee it's the smallest possible commitment you can make and still expect to get some real outcome from it. So what's this picture? Beautiful picture. Those of you that have been there before will know this is Hamilton Island. Um, that's my eldest daughter, Isabella, there. And the reason I'm showing you this picture is I just want to tell you about a recent holiday I had in the last school holidays in July. Um, so. It was in between lockdown five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, whatever it was here in Melbourne. Um, and I got away for four days with the family and it was a great trip. We had a ton of fun, um, did a lot of things. It was nice to get some sunshine in what is typically a very cold, wet and windy time here in Melbourne. Um, and it was on the second day that Isabella said to me, you know what, Dad, I want to walk to the top of this mountain that we are on here. Um, I want to go and see the sunrise in the morning. So I said, no worries. It sounds like a great idea. Let's do that. We'll jump up in the morning. We'll do a bit of exercise. We'll run to the top of the hill, see that sun sunrise. Of course, I knew Isabella wanted to do a TikTok. Uh, I'm impartial to uh, busting out a few dance moves for a TikTok as well. So I thought, what a great experience we'll enjoy together. But I hadn't really thought about it. So what did I do that night? Jumped onto Google, had a look what time the sun would rise. And it was 4.45 a.m. 
Now, everyone knows that one of the joys of having a holiday is being able to sleep in and not having to get into that usual grind of getting up. So I thought, do I really want to do this? No, she's excited. We'll have fun. So I committed. I set my alarm. I went to sleep. Now, what felt like no more than about five minutes later, I heard that da 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 You all know that annoying alarm sound of your iPhone goes off when it was there. So what did I do? I did what we all do. I picked up. I saw the big button. I hit snooze. And I rolled over and I went back to sleep. Eight or nine minutes later, whatever that odd time is, it went off again. And I hit snooze again. About 30 seconds later, I realized, what am I doing? We're going to miss the sunset. How excited was she? So I jumped up. I woke Isabella up. We ran as fast as we possibly could. We got to the top of this hill. We got this magnificent photo. We had a great experience, a ton of fun together. Um, and it's one of those memories that um, will live with us forever. You know, the, the time that your kids are, are children is very, very short. So I'm so, so happy that I did do that and that I didn't just hit snooze again, hit that alarm off and roll over and not actually take that action. So why am I telling you this story? Well, I want you to remember that it's people like what I did on this holiday that actually take those actions, jump up out of bed, don't just hit the snooze button, but actually get the results. I mean, that's a great photo, great experience. Those of you with kids will know how precious those memories are, um, but it would have been so easy for me to have done what most of you will do, which is just hit the snooze button, stop and go back to sleep and wake up later. Um, so I implore all of you, think about it long and hard before you log out of this session and you don't book one of those. If you want to, to get the results, get the action, get these kind of photos, have that experience, create that new home, then you need to take action. And I guarantee you that if you dedicate that 15 to 20 minutes to us, that we will be able to help you move forward on that journey. So that sounds like you and you want to get that experience, you want to get those results, then book one of those sessions now because it will move you forward on that fast track. For those of you that don't, that's fine. But just remember how easy it is to hit the snooze button. And before you know it, 4.45 becomes 9 a.m. and you've lost three hours um, of your time. So don't forget how easy it is to hit snooze versus get up. But it's those people that do take that action, do make those steps that actually will get the results. All right. It's just gone after quarter past three. Um, so let's wrap it up there. Um, to everyone that's hung around, I appreciate you sticking with us. I know we've gone over time. Um, as always, we love doing these sessions. Um, they're great. Hopefully, we've shared a ton of value with you. You're walking out of today's session having gained something new. Um, now, don't forget, as always, we are here every single Wednesday, 2.30 p.m., um, rain, hail, shine, earthquake, whatever it is, um, we'll be here. So please feel free to join us every single week or come just once a month or come every quarter or as often as you want and feel free to bring along any friends you've got. So from me, Greg, Jack and Lucas, um, we very much appreciate your time and thank you very much for hanging around and we look forward to seeing you again soon on one of these sessions.